You're listening to A Creative Excuse, presented by Echo Amano. Our next event is this Friday, June 21st. It's the solstice. 8.30 p.m. We're going to have music with Laughing Branches, a lovely folky acoustic duo, and Theo Krantz, a lovely tape loopy ambient solo. Bring a pillow, because we don't have chairs. It'll be lovely and cozy and fun. If you're sneaky, you can even be YOB. Uh, after that, next Friday, June 28th, uh, is our opening for artist Ben Munoz. Uh, that one's going to start a little earlier, 5 to 8 p.m., and uh, Ben will do an artist talk at 5.30. Um, this series of work uh, is based off of six 8-foot by 4-foot woodcut panels that he spent almost a year and a half carving. Um, they depict the history of his family, starting with his grandfather coming to the U.S. from Mexico City and kind of explore his growing up, that, that the artist that is, um, and the birth of uh, Ben's daughters and exploring the generations in between, using imagery and composition to tell the story. That should be a really great show. So it's going to feature a couple of the, the large eight-foot panels, but also some uh, cut-out sections of the panels that are mounted to wood and um, almost like uh, three-dimensional objects on the wall. So that'll be a cool show. So two events the next two Fridays. This episode is Paula Wilson and Mike Lag and my lovely wife, Kara Duvall. Kara and I drove down to Carrizozo, New Mexico to spend some time with them and spent the night and ran around at their complex U. You'll learn more about what that is. And um, had a lovely chat with them. It's a little bit shorter than usual. We were on a little time crunch and um, the sound isn't the best. It's hard to get four people in on one mic. Paula is having an opening this Saturday, uh, June 22nd, at 516 Arts in Albuquerque. Uh, that opens uh, 6, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, Mike also has some pieces in the show, some collaborative works with Paula. Um, and that show is also with Mira Burak, uh, the lovely Mira Burak. So make sure to check that out as well. Okay, that's all. Enjoy. Does anyone need any peanuts? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> right, crunch, crunch, crunch. Were you saying that peanuts were the the best food or something? Were they the, the original? The original food. Original <laughs> food. Peanuts are the original food. Yeah, I'd say I'm like an Aries. That wasn't. I wasn't saying that, but it's a great food for New Mexico because it's local. You know, uh-huh. and, peanuts uh, are local. They grow them here in, in New Mexico, yes, in Portales. Huh. I didn't know so this. So that, along with green chilies, we should be eating all, all of the peanuts the and time. green chili. Yeah. We should make a, peanut, a green chili peanut sauce. That would be great. <laughs> really oh, delicious. Yeah. That would be like an Asian fusion kind of meal. Yeah. I could kind of see that, yeah, like a We could try sauce. it. Yeah, or green chili covered peanuts. Oh, Interesting. Good. Yeah, not um, the actual sauce, but uh-huh. like a dried, mm-hmm. somehow uh-huh. drying oh, yeah, green yeah, chili. Yeah, that could be mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. That could be good. And then of course, pistachios. They do that with pistachios. They'll flavor that. Uh-huh. Those with the uh, green chili. Yeah, the and they're good. Nuts. They are good. But yeah. I don't do the pistachios, even though they're they're even more local. They're in El Magordo, right? Oh, really? Yeah, there's a lot of pistachio groves there. Mm. Hmm. Um, but, I mean, they must be like the in nut because they're really expensive. <laughs> they are super in right now. Pistachios are raining. It's raining. They've been raining for a while. I know. Pistachios and pinon seem. It's so funny. And it's so funny, right? Because there are pinon trees everywhere here. Mm-hmm. But you go and you buy a bag of pinon nuts and it's. 12 bucks for that bag of pinion nuts. Yeah. yeah. It's because it's so much work to get the, mm-hmm. the juice out of that mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. 
Well, speaking of nuts, um, <laughs> so I want to start off talking about your your what do you what do you call it the complex mm. the 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 theater slash hotel slash studio uh, project. Um, so do you want to just start off and saying just like what is it um, when it happened. Just kind of dive into that. Sure. So we call it the complex U, uh -huh. which our friend introduced us. It's a French term. And when you add the U, it sort of means buildings, but also kind of an ideology around the buildings and like what mm -hmm. happens in the building. So we call it the lyric complex U. Mm. Nice answer. <laughs> and it's just a U with a... Asterisk. With it. Okay. But there's An also accent. some double meaning mm. behind that too, because when you say it, I right. I went to oh the yes the individual is very complex yes yes <laughs> and what's what's it comprised of so the it's three buildings that were all built by Ira Whitmore in 1914 mm -hmm. and they start with the old Cibola Hotel which is on the corner and then the middle building uh, was a Ford garage. And then the last building was uh, the Crystal Opera House, which mm. did like vaudeville traveling shows on a mm. constrained stage with dancing girls, one of the newspaper articles said. And now, uh, then in the middle building became a brewery, a Sierra Blanca Brewery in the aughts. Famous for Alien Ale. Mm. Huh. Alien not. Ale. Alien Ale. Was it green? No. Okay, no, it was, just, it was just, was it so strong that you felt like you were abducted or why, why was it alien ale? I, I think he thought it was a good marketing name. Okay. And we went for it. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention it was a great beer. Yeah. And all three of these buildings uh, stopped being used in uh, 1975. Mm. Mm. So I'm curious, you said it was done for vaudeville and burlesque, and in the theater, on the stage, on um, on the side of the stage, there's a piece that I am guess you, you did, mm -hmm. that's a bunch of women figures I, in a row. I, I see them as tassels. As tassels? Uh -huh. okay. I love that they're, yes, I love that idea so of movement. And, I was uh, wondering, so, figuration. yeah, but I was wondering... Where did that come from? I was thinking, oh, it came because this place was a burlesque. Do you want to describe vaudeville. it a little bit more? Yeah, so it's this stage, right? It's raised, and you, it, like you said, it's constrained. It's not like a full-size stage. It's probably half the size of a stage, a I normal like stage. And then in the front of the stage, you put all of these little different glass bottles um, that get lit from below on an automatic switch uh, that's triggered by movement mm -hmm. in the space and then the back of the um, stage is a huge painting on canvas that's in blacks and grays and whites and again there's just a bunch of movement in there and I saw them as limbs. And I like it, yes. And I saw the paint, the painting in the front that covers the stage as m limbs as well, or bodies moving. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> I love hearing your description. Um, the the backdrop in the back, I think of also as almost cac cacti, you know, uh -huh. uh, Segoro cacti. But then, I mean, those amazing plants also always look like people and bodies and sculptures mm -hmm. totally when so. we were driving here there's that stretch where there's all the yucca and i think i said i was asleep and i woke up and i looked out and i go look there's a little cactus people exactly <laughs> exactly yeah 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 and yeah. yeah yeah who hasn't went to tucson and taken a picture in front of the sequoia mm -hmm. cactus with them like this right yeah. yeah imitating the gesture yeah so I'm curious about the, um, you know, so how, like, so you have this, these, these three different buildings. One's your studio. Right. Both of you work out of there, right? They're separate buildings, actually. Okay. Sort of. 
So both of, but both of you work, let's say, in the in the complex. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So both you. of you have your studios there. In the complex, <laughs> you. In the complex, you. In the complex, you. And then, and then, so you have so the theater space. Since we're on that, um, you've well, I want to. One of the things that I think is really interesting is is coming into a space that feels it feels neglected on the one hand. And it's in like a, it's a, it's in a really big state of disrepair, right? And coming in and saying we're not necessarily going to restore this to some former glory, or even get it to a point where like it might pass some kind of inspection. <laughs> um, Anywhere close. <laughs> but like, <laughs> we we want to use this space somehow we want the space to be activated we want this space to be a point of contact for community mm -hmm. so i'm interested in that and just like like i've been that's one of the things that like i thought about a lot the last time i was here and just walking around the space now is like you know i don't know it makes me think of just like working with what you've got mm -hmm. and like this is what we can do with it and I don't know, maybe I, I'm interested in like how you guys see that, that what I think you, you've talked a lot about people coming in and saying, what are you going to do with the place? <laughs> right. What's it going to become? And what I mm. kind of hear you saying is like, what is it now? Mm -hmm. Is that that's yeah, it's really nice to hear you reflect that back. Yeah, that's right on. I mean, we we we've accepted its condition like uh, um and it's it's fortunate on our part because you know we there's no other sort of resources you know that that we have that can kind of uh, even be thrown at it. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we uh, the way I look at it is it's like our 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 own bodies. You know we we don't necessarily like the condition mm -hmm. that we're in a lot of times, but we'd be better off if we mm -hmm. accepted them and. Uh, and accepted the lifespan of our bodies as well. And I think way too often we try to make things last forever mm -hmm. when when there is there shouldn't be anything that lasts forever. You know, it's all you know uh, right. going away. Yeah, we were talking uh, about that earlier, just like with uh, Ray Kurzweil and like yes. wanting to experience like immortality or something, and like uh -huh. you know, and thinking about like how you know we we look at death as like a flaw or something that it's actually a, a feature <laughs> i feel like at this point i want for the audience to get a picture of what this place looks like because i feel like we've talked about its dilapidation and its yeah. disrepair but they mm. don't know well, what it, that is and so yeah. could one of you describe like maybe a corner and uh, just Okay, let's let us <laughs> each pick pick a corner and we'll and we'll go around. Um, yeah. So we'll start with the outside. Uh, there is um, a ticket taker booth that is filled with a ticket taker that uh, Mike made, and it's got uh, a jaw that moves and can ingest money or tickets depending. On its mood. On its mood. <laughs> <laughs> and then you step inside. And the first thing you're going to see is the popcorn machine, which doesn't equate to dilapidation any whatsoever. It's uh, it's kind of a... It just makes delicious popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> but when you lock, walk into the, the main space, there's very a few theater seats, and what you're most taken by is the ceiling panels which are falling um, and uh, um, the curtains of the stage which are um, sort of frayed on the ends mm -hmm. and uh, in, in the wind that blows in Carrizozo frequently you'll you'll hear the fiberglass roofing material flapping <laughs> and uh, Think, think that there are ghosts in the attic. <laughs> yeah. And and so you haven't walked too far yet still into the theater. Mm -hmm. You're still in that first portion that's by the, the ticket area and the popcorn area. And you look over to your right and there's this huge staircase. 
Mm. That is only half a staircase. (laughs) And the other half, which connects to the ground, has fallen. So (laughs) there is, I mean, probably how far up is that staircase? It goes 30 feet. I like it. Maybe 30 feet up into the air and descends to maybe about 15 feet and then just abruptly ends. And in front of the staircase are all of these huge um, poles or or um, parts of the staircase at one point that are... It was, they were there to be, finish the staircase. <laughs> yeah. Right. Ba- banisters. Banisters. And they just, they have red... Bulbs. Bulbs, bulbs. On, on, yeah, on top of them. And they're just sticking out. Mm-hmm. Like a bouquet. Like a bouquet, <laughs> yes. And then... Yeah. So that's, I think that gives a pretty good idea. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, and, and I can post a picture on the on the you know page as well. I mean, I think it'll be a, somewhat impossible to really convey. You know, you just have to be there, right? Well, I, yeah. One important note might be the fumbling found or the crumbling foundation that you mm-hmm. know kind of makes the whole scene appear somewhat. Um, precarious. Precarious. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And we were. I was definitely thinking about that when we were having the musical performance the other day with the with Stowe who was playing the Carrizo grass with his electronic fingered gloves and uh, as loud as possible with the amplifier. I was thinking, wow, this is how this is where the 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 walls should start crumbling in in, in the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The finale, the ceiling just drops. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I mean, that was definitely the sensation that like sticks out to me mm. is like a sense of just like a little unease, just like, whoa, well, what's, mm-hmm. where should I not step here? Mm-hmm. What's where should where am I mm-hmm. going? Um, so you guys do performances in there. You'll screen movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had poetry readings, uh-huh. lectures, karaoke night, dance mm-hmm. party, mm-hmm. conversations like mm-hmm. a round table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then and then you also are involved in the artist in residence program here. Is that something you started or you're just involved with? I st- uh, we uh, uh, co-founded it with uh, Joan and Warren mm-hmm. Malkerson, and uh, we run it together. It's now in its fourth year, mm-hmm. and we welcome people for two weeks to two months, and it's mm-hmm. free, free to do it. You get a studio space and a living space, and often the artists will want to activate the the lyric as mm-hmm. part of um, as part of their residency. I mean, when you were sort of talking about this idea that we're more interested in kind of maintaining play mm-hmm. in, in the theater rather than some kind of restoring it to its uh, former glory, I think that there is, it's, it's easy to do that in a way with that space because people naturally insert themselves it, into it. It has this kind of um, open bookness where one can imagine what they would do. Um, mm. And I think that that's part, mm. you know, there aren't a ton of seats in the theater. Uh, we like that kind of open floor plan. It's mm. interesting. So it's like uh, coming in, they kind of create in their own imagination what they might do if they have the resources right. to, to change it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. And it's one of the ways we dealt with initially that question of what are you going to do with the space? We we asked and video recorded people saying what they would do with the space mm-hmm. yeah that's cool yeah one one time somebody asked me if, if uh so are we are we open for business now <laughs> i say well we're probably open for criticism <laughs> but not for business <laughs> and i'm sure we get some of that i mean there's got to be some people who say well, they're not doing nothing with that place they're just letting uh-huh. it fall down uh-huh. which it's true. <laughs> There's no, mm. We're just letting it uh, fall down. Mm. Well, it's interesting because, like, I mean, there there are a lot of buildings in Carrizozo that seem empty or abandoned, right? So, I mean, it's so I'm I'm in in my head I'm like putting together like this this little pocket of creativity, right? You said there's more artists per capita in Carrizozo than anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. What, 40, 50 out of 1,000 or something? Mm-hmm. Um, so you have you have community here, right? You've got people who clearly have some level of buy-in, maybe to the community itself or just to being around other artists. 
and then you also have like uh, an, an impoverishment, right? So it's, it's an interesting just collection of people and vibes and conditions, right? It's, it feels really unique. I mean, maybe I just haven't seen enough. And, and do you feel like somehow the theater is the epicenter of that or somehow reflects that general? I don't know. Vibe? I mean, I, to me, maybe because I haven't experienced much of Carrizozo. So to me, that's like, I see it. It's like, oh, that's like the, the main, or maybe your house is like the epicenter. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, this place yeah. is where it's at. That works for us. Yeah. Um, I like looking at the theater in its condition as a really kind of a good representation of Carrizozo in general because mm-hmm. it, it is Carrizozo is kind of that it's yeah. pretty run down, pretty uh, junked out, and uh, and people mm. people like their junk in general. And uh, yeah, and yet in this within that, like what you were saying Paula about people coming in and being able to insert themselves and imagine that that that's possible here right right that's it yeah earlier today Frank and I were walking around and we met Scott Goey Scott Goey and um he told us this whole story about you know how he used to live in Santa Fe and he saw uh, an advertisement for Carrizozo, and Carrizozo said, Carrizozo likes, loves artists. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> he uh, threw it away, and then later on somehow found it again and moved here and was able. I'm scared. I'm scared to say this on the podcast because I don't want you to have like a bunch of people moving all of a sudden. <laughs> but <laughs> bought his house. And this was back in 94? I think he said 94. For $3,000. Woo, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and um, his right. son is here. And there's just this, this, um, what, what do I want to say? Like feeling of potential. But feeling or... of potential amidst. A bunch of dilapidation. Right. Yes. Yeah. And that's such a interesting, juicy paradox. And I'm also curious, like, about your work mm-hmm. and how, because I feel that in your work as well, your individual work. Right. Mm-hmm. Was that was that in your work before you moved to Carrizozo, or did Carrizozo inform it, or I I think that there is there is an overlap, but I've always found it so fascinating just to be an artist alive at this time right now and Mm -hmm. I feel like that's one of the things that's most interesting about our time is this influx of technology in a way that um, I mean every society has every generation has their technology that that they're dealing with but we have this sort of ancient life around us and then also this you know this incredible technology and the fact that those things are hand in hand is often something I try to depict in my work. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't like the idea of thinking of myself as a recycled artist, you know, or like, mm-hmm. but when I look back at, even from my earliest beginnings, I, I have always taken recycled things to, and, and tried to make something out of them, whether it be Either a neater looking trash pile or or actually <laughs> utilizing it in some other project. And so uh, I, I didn't I didn't go looking for this complex you. It, you know, it just kind of happened um, you know kind of n- natural way and, and it, it's uh, it's worked out in the sense that now I, I have this place to put. Everything that I ever like want to make, I have I have room for it in this mm-hmm. this space, and um, that's that's kind of a comforting in, in its own in its own way because I I I, I don't have to finish anything anymore because I can <laughs> got room to spare. <laughs> yeah, great. talk about an endless lifespan. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the thing that, that I just, I keep coming back to, and what, what I think that your the complex you reveals for me is it brings up, like, this sense of, like, something's not right. 
and what you guys have done is is said this is fine mm. and I think it, it confronts in me this sense of like that something needs to change and I guess it, you know getting back to like the personal level like just looking at ourselves you mentioned like being comfortable in our own bodies you know having things that we we don't like about them mm. or whatever or maybe our personality or whatever it might be but like coming back to this sense of like like real radical acceptance you know because like on on so many different levels you know, you could look at that build, the, those buildings and be like, that's not okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I love that what you're doing is saying, like, it is what it is. It's enough. And we can do something beautiful with it. I love that. And, and, and I think that's, that's the thing that has just sort of, like, been sort of hovering around my consciousness since I've been here. Mm-hmm. Um, is, yeah, maybe that's what it is, like, radical acceptance. I love it. I'm, I think that... We both in our work have a very, in part because of the buildings, have a very long kind of expansive trajectory of how long something gets to, to be made. And mm. I'm often kind of mining things that I made years ago, you know, mm. five, ten years ago that I thought like this is nothing or I was into mm. it at the time and then I put it away and pull it back out. Mm. And it, it can have that kind of, it can take on new life or be mm. that missing piece. Mm very opposite to the secret the secret life of tidying up or what is ah, that book? Ah, the Marie the, Kondo, yes, yeah. Kondo oh, no. <laughs> movement. Oh, no. I know. Well I do I I, I I do think about that, that idea of, of do you love this thing? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, because that's the the choice she gives you, right? Yeah. Um, or some version of it that I yeah. got it on a late night television show where she was a guest. I, I, yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I do feel that. what happens if you just like a lot of things. You love a lot of things. Right. And I mean, I, and I do feel a little ADD with some of my like scraps. I mean, I have uh, uh, folders where they're organized and mm-hmm. I, I, I never throw away uh, pieces. Uh, but I, I do have a rule that if it drops on the ground, and without me wanting it there, I have to throw it away. That's like how I control my hoarding mm. tendency or something. Like that role. Really? Wow. Cool. Yeah. It's a sign. <laughs> yeah, it can be hard. Well, it seems like you guys do put a lot of like parameters and structure on how you work. I mean, is that how do you what does that do for you when like you have like this is the, this is the time when we go to the studio this is the time we go home if it falls on the floor i throw it away like how does that help you funnel or does it help you funnel creative energy is that what it does i don't know how to answer that i exactly other than to say that um, I'm, I'm pretty routine oriented mm-hmm. you know i like doing my set things mm-hmm. Um, so that leads to creativity when I can mm-hmm. follow a schedule, mm-hmm. and um, and so um, we're pretty regimented till like four twenty, and we have that. We always kind of keep an option where we can do the third shift, you know, if we're really mm-hmm. into something mm-hmm. or whatever, you know. But um, we we always feel well, you know, mm-hmm. we we can save that for tomorrow. I mean, mm-hmm. let's you know. What, yeah. what do we really need to do today? It reminds me of um, another person you've done a podcast with, Erin Elder, mm. came out here, and she's a curator, amongst other things. And she noticed that among artists working in isolated rural communities, that they tend to have very regimented routines. It's mm. a kind of a way to, yeah, to keep it to keep it moving, or mm. it, that she kind of equated that mm-hmm. those two things together, and mm-hmm. it kind of makes sense for me mm-hmm. when you have your day entirely be- ahead of you. Neither of us have right. real jobs, you know that mm-hmm. um, that can be a little Ooh. overwhelming. Real job? <laughs> oh, what? Oh, my man, my man. <laughs> no, that's funny though, because I mean, I think that's right. You know, it's like meaning that like your momentum has to be self-generated, mm-hmm. right? You're not, you know, nobody's saying you got to be here at nine o'clock you know you don't have like you know the hustle bustle of like you know being in new york city or something where like everybody's like oh i'm i'm working this thing i'm doing this hustle i've got this this idea and you're like oh i guess i gotta keep up yeah um your momentum has to be Mm -hmm. self-directed yeah and there's not a lot of distractions Mm -hmm. out here either 
Yeah. There, there's a fair amount. I mean, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, yeah we, I mean, tonight we have a meeting we're going to. We, <laughs> we've, we've had like What's three the guests last week that left. Uh, it's the uh, uh, Carrizozo uh, Artists Weekend meeting. Yeah, which is taking place on August uh, 17th and 18th at Carrizozo. And there are 42 artists in in the tour. Which... It was 41 the last time I heard. Yeah, <laughs> man. See? Things are happening like I said. <laughs> That's awesome. the past hour. Yeah. There's one more artist exactly. added. And we caught the update. Is there a way to find out more about that online? Or? Uh, well, that's part of the meeting. Is okay. I'm um, I'm gonna try to really encourage a website yeah. uh, creation. Nice. So. Just mm -hmm. like my landing page. Right. Like, exactly. Here's all the info. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So so look it up when uh, when we get to August or something. Right. Um, I like it. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I'm interested in like how both of you kind of play off of each other in terms of what you do because like I mean even like on the surface like you were wearing a shirt that I think you printed last right. night. I mean, did, you print, did you print that one as well? Um, uh, yeah, we printed it on one of our moments yeah, of print so, days. So there you go. And then you're, you know, wearing his wood, wood stuff. You got your utility belt. <laughs> so it's like your guys' work is like molding onto each other. How do you, I mean, can you talk about that a bit? Like how, if there's any influence there mm -hmm. and playing off of each other's work? Well, it's a great way to collaborate when you can hand stuff off to the other partner mm. that you don't have any talent for. Which um, um, Paula has these this talent for color and, and printing and and all this. And, and as a woodworker, you know, I'm basically don't work with color at all. Mm -hmm. You know, wood is you know pretty benign in its lack of color. And, but that's what I'm comfortable with. So, but I I, I like signing pieces of color, like you know, um, a little turquoise in a table. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's. I find it hard sometimes to answer the simple question of like how we collaborate, mm -hmm. um, because in part just our lives are so um, intertwined and our art is so manifested in our lives. Like we are constantly, uh, very consciously collapsing the distance between art and life. Uh, so mm -hmm. we eat on all plates that Mike's made. Um, we both wear each other's clothing, you know, clothing that I've made, like you pointed out, the jewelry. Um, but that just feels like, a, like these almost byproducts to just skim the surface of how intertwined we are. And then at the same time, we. We go to the studio and we go to our separate studios most often. You know, we're mm -hmm. not working together day, mm -hmm. day to day. Yeah, I mean, that's very apparent. I mean, you walk around your property and it's like every everything feels like a little piece of art, you know. And I love that being able to um, to sort of translate that. And I get when you were talking, like, it made me think, like, those are also just, like, artifacts in a way right mm, yeah. like the jewelry or the clothing or like pieces in on the property are just like little artifacts of process right Remainders, i mean i guess right. that's what art art artifacts <laughs> right, right. Right. <laughs> is that where that word comes from wait a second <laughs> <laughs> we're on to something here <laughs> uh, yeah i mean we're sitting in your kitchen right now we're sitting at this gorgeous table that is very elegant, actually. It's probably one of your more elegant pieces, I'm guessing. Well, thank you. And, <laughs> and then behind you is this, the kitchen area filled with the bowls and the things that you've made, but then every square inch of the wall is your painting, Paula, and it looks kind of like wallpaper, but it's, mm -hmm. you've done this everything in here <laughs> and I look around and I go and like at at first I was amazed and I go what did they do what did they not do mm. and now I'm in this mindset of like everything in here <laughs> has been made by them yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah we have a game in the kitchen there uh, are four things out of wood that Mike has not made <laughs> and so what are they you can, yeah you can hunt them out and <laughs> I know the drying <laughs> rack 
you got it. That's <sighs> one. <Good job. laughs> but I imagine, like, you know, living in a place like this affords you the ability to do that without, you know, you don't need to ask for permission from the city to paint your walls or things like that, right? Yeah, and we feel really lucky um, living here and knowing, I mean, I've lived here for five, for 10 years, Mike's lived here for 15 years, and then we've both been in the area longer than that. And so we know a lot of the people. So when there's a planning and zoning thing, it's not it's not strangers that we're go- that we're coming to. You know, we can mm-hmm. they they know our story. Um, they know what the, they know the building story before we we took it on. So there's um, yeah, there's there's very little regulation here so far. Um, but there's also that's a result of having built strong connections and relationships. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. What is Ah, this is <laughs> this is the top five <laughs> pieces. But what are in your studio? Are there certain things in there that you feel the most delighted by, or mm. you see them and you still get giddy? Maybe all all of it. Yeah, I know I have one, and I've only been in there twice. Uh huh. Um. I mean, there are a few things that Mike made that, like, if the if the building was on fire, like, I would want to go oh, yeah. go in and get. It. And one is this tool belt that he made me, which houses my cell phone, my scissors, and uh, a, there's a magnet there for pins. And I feel lost without that whenever I'm working. Um, and a, a piece of mine is this. Uh, it's a kind of rug piece uh, that's a faux mosaic that I painted and. I feel like that I would never really want to sell or be be away from it it, it. it was something that I made when I was really struggling in the studio and didn't kind of have a direction. And I would just, um, in a very kind of methodical way, paint these, these small little uh, stone pieces. And it reminds me of that kind of dilapidation and renewal and rebirth mm. um, that we've already been talking about. So those are some of the things that come to mind. Mm. Yeah, that pat piece would be mine as well. I mean, it, it's I liked how you uh, compared it to the dilapidation of uh, our complex U because I came way before mm-hmm. the complex U and and um, and it, it it incorporate it was a collaboration as well because it was made with the wooden slat technique which um, we kind of developed as a way to. Um, kind of work together on the same projects and uh, and I remember when we were gluing those sticks onto the canvas it was like in the middle of this like the worst blizzard Carrizozo ever had <laughs> um, and we couldn't like we couldn't even get out to the studio it was like too cold and snowy but we we, we did it right in the, the dining room or the yeah the living room there and we were took up the whole space just to glue up that piece because it's like eight foot tall and six feet wide mm. Mm. but we did it during the worst blizzard of 2006 <laughs> yeah baby yes. i love that memory <laughs> and how about your answer though uh something something of mine to you or that um, well, I'm, one that comes to mind is the most ridiculous giddy one to me is, and that's the big inner tube with the Penis like in b- glowing gul- bulb on the end of it, you know. Uh, yeah, it's sort of like this. Um, it both looks like a vagina and a penis. Oh, and I saw yeah, that. it's yeah. like it's uh-huh. a transgendered sculpture kind of thing. Uh-huh. Intersex, yeah. intersex, intersex. Yeah, yeah. Save the intersex. <laughs> yes. That's and that's another example of something that. Um, just sort of that was in the hotel or yeah it was just a example well the way it sort of happened was I remember hanging up the inner tube on the wall because it was there and it was in my way or whatever and and I remember you looking at it and saying oh wow that looks like a pussy For some reason. 
I'm glad that that's the thing that you would say if the building was burning. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I also like the fact that we lit a fire inside the building today. Yes. And so, like, the idea of the burning, uh, the building burning down is not that far from, like, things that we've been set in motion. Mm. Knock on wood, not that I'm asking for that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I want to give some time to um, this, this question, which I've been asking everybody, is if there's um, a piece of art, uh, music, theater, etc., could have been a class even mm -hmm. that sort of changed the way that you look at art, the way that you went about your movement as an artist, mm -hmm. some sort of pivotal artistic aha moment, something like that. Um, I, I'll go with one more recent. I mm -hmm. saw the uh, Carrie James Marshall exhibition in Chicago. He's an African-American painter who lives and works in Chicago, which is where I, I grew up. And uh, he's a painter, so it's, it's very traditional work in some ways, like these very colorful uh, figurative paintings. And he only paints African-Americans or just people of color or black people. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I saw that show, I've never been more proud of being a person of color. And I felt that it, it just, he just made blackness look so beautiful and rich and, mm -hmm. um, and like an endless wellspring to draw from. And so I, I faced the world differently after after seeing that exhibition and it, it made me reconsider the power of art, especially the power of painting to, to transform our consciousness. Mm. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. I don't think I have an answer to that. I've, I've, uh, um, <clears throat> I, I get sort of flack sometimes from people when I, I kind of poo poo the nation, the notion of, of, of an artist. And I, I, I don't even like referring to myself in that way, and not because I don't feel like I'm a creative genius, <laughs> but, but artists, um, and I just that just feels too limiting in a way, you know, that, that term, you know, because I'm way much more than just an artist. So, um, what is the but, boundary of an artist in your mind? I guess the boundary of an artist is that you... You are, uh, you are, you're making or creating um, works of art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> More artifacts. <laughs> what if you are but, one who takes lots of artifacts <laughs> and from those artifacts create mm -hmm. functional pieces? Or what if you were to answer the question outside of it being like a sanctioned art viewing experience mm -hmm. and thought of something that impacted you just as an artist? Well, that that's a good good framework. I mean, I can answer that in that in, when I took up woodworking, I was kind of uh, invited into this space by this uh Sawyer guy who who worked with a lot of mesquite wood and and he just you know said you know just allowed me into his workshop where I was able to kind of play with the materials and the tools that I I never kind of uh, had access to um, so that would be um, kind just of my, the trans yeah that was where I got the bug in and, and couldn't. Uh, couldn't couldn't go back after after that to anything mm. other than mm, making my own kind of hands do the work or do the li do my living. Mm. Mm. And you, Kara? Oh, I get to answer this question. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the first time you've been on. Okay. Oh <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Something I want to I want to answer it with something recent because I do have something in mind, but it's something I saw a long time ago. 
We'll just go with it. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, <laughs> I just recently, I'm going with the recent thing. I just recently, recent meaning a night and a half ago, <laughs> went to the Santa Fe annual dance showcase that the um, New Mexico Dance Coalition puts on every year for, I said, I think 32 years. And it's great because they will just accept anyone. You just turn in an application and then you get to perform. And so you get to see a wide range of talent, of uh, expression, of dance you know there are people that come and do belly dance there was a woman that was doing some t type of traditional Indian folk dance with the whole get up mm. and um, and there was this woman who did a piece that um, she was dressed like almost like a woman from Mary Antoinette times French um, Baroque. I, I'm not sure. She had the whole get up and her face was painted white and she had bright red lipstick on that had glitter. And she was moving in these very tiny jerky movements, very controlled and very grotesque and their, and their um, jerkiness. And she was making these faces as well with her with her face that almost looked reminded me of like Chucky's bride or something oh, and 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 these little pirouettes and these little po um, toes would point and um, there was something so uh, enveloping it, it 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 brought me in and I was also repelled by it simultaneously and I just felt this immense tension in the room as everyone was watching this woman perform in this um, annual dance, New Mexico annual dance showcase. Oh, and yes. and uh, speaking with a friend afterwards about this experience, you know, she said the whole thing mm, brought for her a sense of like, I don't. I just, she said something like, I don't want any of my sisters to dim their light anymore. I just want everyone to show up and offer up whatever their, whatever their expression and their truth is. And that's kind of what it was watching this woman. Mm. Yeah. I, wow. Nice answer. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And I love it for this conversation where this idea of radical acceptance and, mm. and a sense of unease is kind of um, mm -hmm. on the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. What about you, Frank? Well, I've answered this question a number of times. Yeah, so Is you have time different? Yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hard. I mean, I've actually been thinking for the past two minutes while you were talking about like what, how I would answer it now. You haven't been listening to my answer? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean... I don't have an answer for mm. it right now. Well, coming here, yeah, has shifted things for you. I'm seeing the artwork in here. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to process that for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I need with. I guess I mean to kind of play off what you just said. Like I, when I see stuff, typically like it takes me a while to to distill. Um, any type of like understanding that I can even give words to. Um, I guess in coming back to like radical acceptance, like I think that's something for me, like I've, I've often been like, oh, why can't I just like verbalize these certain things mm -hmm. that like I experience? Like, like I feel like it's almost like in certain uh, experiences, um, I'm so wide open sometimes that like I don't even have like, I can't even name the thing that I'm seeing. But it's only after some time where like I'm thinking about it and like putting it into context when I can actually, oh, that's what that was. Mm -hmm. That's what that, so I don't know how to talk about the past two days. Um, right, and even Kara's, your story, you know, it's 
talking with your friend afterwards you yeah. really crystallized mm-hmm. what what you both had experienced yeah mm-hmm. sure a little bit of distance yeah and then the question is what does stick with you i mean that's mm-hmm. its own like, right. filtering mechanism mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right right i mean the last answer i gave um was was with nina and aaron um there, at, when I was in Oaxaca last, there was a, an exhibition where they had um, put Ameri- uh, North American artists with uh, Oaxacan artisans, um, people who were creating objects, but not necessarily in a quote-unquote art context, like in the sense that like maybe thinking their work would be in a gallery or museum, but just maybe more working on like a functional craftsmanship level. Um, and so putting these two artists together. Anyway, so there was this one piece that... It was a three-channel video. Um, each each screen was maybe 15 feet wide, so it was enormous. It was like wow. 45 feet wide. Um, and each one was maybe like 8 to 10 feet high. Um, and so what what they had done was they had, there was four women who were the sort of subjects of the video for the most part. And they start off and one's wearing black, one's wearing white, one's wearing red, and one's wearing blue. And they're all in a circle standing on rocks, just like in the most beautiful landscape you've ever seen, just looking at each other. And then it moves into this, like, where they're doing some movement together and, like, they're in a circle and each woman is grabbing the next woman's hair and they're kind of doing this sort of circular movement. And then it goes into these, these rituals and... Um, it, it's it's really hard to talk about. Um, the woman's name who was working on it is Rebecca Mendez, I believe is her name. Um, and I forget the name of the other artist working with them. But it was a piece that, for me, w- made evident like this the idea of like the presence of the goddess and recognizing like that that energy is is here and it's like pushing on everything that's happening right now and like making itself known and present but it was one of those things that like made me think about like all the different energies that are present that you know may not be victorious but are constantly influencing and changing reality and the way we move and the way we act and the way that we think Mm -hmm. um like it just it, the video was like this just presence of like really old ways mm-hmm. of of viewing the world, um, and maybe that's like not the right way to put it uh, because people still view the world that way. But yeah. it felt old, mm-hmm. and but it also felt real. Mm-hmm. Like no happy ever after kind of ending or way of looking at a narrative. Sort of. It was. It was. It was more just like. Um, it was just these really uh, very just ritualistic yeah. and um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to talk about it. The actually. word that yeah. comes to mind is roots, possibly. I was thinking mm-hmm. archetypes. That it Archetypal. Has. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lineage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. A living lineage mm-hmm. in the sense of what you said, that people still practice this way mm-hmm. and it's not anything new. We've mm-hmm. been practicing this way for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Present it again so we can remember. Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. Um, any, I don't know, upcoming shows that you want to plug? Uh, yes. I have a show at 516 called Entangled that opens June 22nd and is on through the end of August Albuquerque in Albuquerque uh, Central and Mike and I have some of our collaborative pieces in it and we're we're planning to sort of create a little domestic space that hopefully has some flavor of life and Carrizozo within the the white cube cool yeah yeah we're one of the pieces that we made was this vanity that um, it's, it's a woodworking piece largely and but Paula did a uh, design of her signature butt figures in, uh, in a part, a piece of the, the table, which is, uh, would be, yeah, I think it's a first as far as um, our working together. Nice. 
Mm -hmm. And she's also going to help me design a chair, I believe, for this vanity. There's going to be a set of furniture. Cool. Sweet. But that's yet to be to be done. So we'll see how that goes. Right. We try not to talk about things before we make them because then mm -hmm. sometimes that dissipates. You know. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us in your beautiful place. Thank you for the amazing bowls. <laughs> <laughs> Love them so much. I feel like I need deodorant now. Oh! <laughs> Go on.